Okay, let's continue with this third video. This time we're going to look at the anatomy of the heart. So I'll assume you don't know anything coming into this. The heart has a substernal location. What that means is it is deep to your sternum or your breastbone. So it is in the midline of your heart. So all those time in grade school when you put your hand over your heart here above your left breast, well, that's not where your heart is. It's here in the midline of the heart. That's why CPR is given over your sternum. Yes, there is part of the heart that goes over into the left rib cage area. And notice that the heart actually sits on the diaphragm. If you look at the surface of the heart, as you age, it actually becomes fatty. Um, here's what a heart looks like if it's taken out of a body um, fresh. You can see that there are major blood vessels attached to it. So let's look at a drawing of the heart. And surrounding the heart, we have that pericardium. So the heart is not inside the pericardial sac. That is something that a lot of students get wrong. So remember the pericardial sac is kind of like a water balloon. And so if you put your fist coming to the side of the water balloon, you're going to have the rubber, both sides of the rubber, and your fist is going to be the heart. So you'll have one layer of the water balloon, you'll have a little bit of fluid, and then you have the other layer. And so that's what's shown over here where there's one layer and there's the other layer. So this is the pericardial sac there. It surrounds the heart and it actually attaches up here at the upper surface of the heart where those large blood vessels are. So the heart itself does not sit inside that pericardial sac. But there is a little bit of fluid in there because you know that heart is contracting. And so just think of it doing this 60 times or more a second. And if you do this with your hands, you can see that your hands would warm up. And so that fluid cuts down on that friction. Now the heart muscle itself, we take the prefix myo, which means muscle, and we take the prefix cardi, which means heart. And so it's called the myocardium. Looking at myocardium, looking at the myocytes, which you remember before when we looked at muscle, when we were learning about tissues, is cardiac muscle is striated just like skeletal muscle, but unlike skeletal muscle, it is branched so that the cells can talk with other cells. Um, most of the cells only have one nucleus, but occasionally there will be binucleated cells, but mostly just uninucleated. And there, there are these very special connections that you can see here. I pointed them out here. You can see them in this middle picture as well. And they are these blue lines in the cartoon drawing at top. And these are called intercalated discs, which is a term you need to know. And what intercalated discs are rows as in hundreds of gap junctions between adjacent cardiac muscle cells. And what that does is it allows ions in one cardiac muscle to almost immediately pass into the adjacent muscle cell. So when we are having depolarization happening in one muscle cell, that ion change is going to happen immediately in adjacent muscle cells. And because they're branched, it's not just going to be end to end to one. It's going to go to mus multiple adjacent muscle cells. All right. So looking at the heart itself, as I said there uh, before, the heart muscle is called the myocardium, shown here in red. The surface of the heart has to have an epithelial lining because all surfaces in the body have an epithelial lining. So that is called the epicardium. The epicardium is, is also one of the layers of the pericardium, um, but... So they're both the same layer. 
And then the inner surface of the heart, because it's a surface, also has to have an epithelial lining because it's on the inside, is called the endocardium. So both of these are just going to be um, simple squamous epithelial linings. Um, to look at the heart, when you look at like this, you can see the heart does not sit square like this box here, but it's actually angled and it's actually sort of rotated so that we're not seeing all of the left side of the heart when we're looking at the front of the heart. We're seeing more of the right side of the heart when we look at the front of the heart. But to understand the anatomy, I'm just going to try to show it to you as like a heart in the box. So the heart has four chambers. Each of the upper chambers is called an atrium. So I don't know if you've ever heard in a large building, the entranceway can be called a vestibule. It also could be called an atrium, depending what part of the country you are in. So that is the entryway into the heart, the upper chambers. And the lower chambers of the heart, each one is called a ventricle. So looking at the heart, if it would be on your right side, it's called the right. If it would be on your left side, it's called the left. So we have a right atrium and a left atrium and a right ventricle and a left ventricle. Now, in order to leave one of these chambers, you have to go through an opening. Just like to leave a room, you go through a doorway. Well, the doorways in the chambers of the heart are known as valves. So exiting an atrium takes you into a ventricle, but exiting a ventricle takes you into an artery. It's going to take you into a blood vessel, specifically an artery. So let's look first at the valves that are between the atria and the ventricles. So on the right side of the heart, we have the tricuspid valve sitting here between the right atrium and the right ventricle. It's called the tricuspid valve because tri is the prefix that means three and it has three little cusps. And this is what it looks like in this picture down here. And so the valve is this solid white part. And on the left side of the heart, we have what is called the mitral valve between the left atrium and the left ventricle. Some people have called it the bicuspid valve because it only has two cusps, but clinically we call it the mitral valve because all of our diseases are called diseases of the mitral valve, like mitral valve prolapse, mitral regurgitation. They're not called bicuspid regurgitation or anything like that. And if you're wondering where that word mitral comes from, it comes from the name for a bishop's mitre, which was a half the bishop or the Pope of Rome because he, of the Pope who's the Bishop of Rome and he wears that hat. So maybe you have seen that hat before. So when you look at these two valves, what you'll notice is they are attached to these stringy things, which actually are attached to these muscles inside the ventricles, the right and the left ventricles. So we have structures inside the ventricles. And so the muscles which extend upward, you're extending upward from the floor of the ventricles, these muscles are called papillary muscles. And they're going to attach to those strings, which were attached to the tricuspid and mitral valves. And those strings are called the chordae tendinae. So you may be asking yourself, what are these for? And a lot of students sit there and they go, oh, I know how this works. The chordae tend the papillary muscles contract and the chordae tendon, they pull on the valve and they open the valve. And that is absolutely wrong. That's not how they work at all. Good guess. Thank you for thinking, but wrong. Okay. Have you ever heard that saying, pulling on my heartstrings? Well, your chordae tendon are the heartstrings that they're talking about. So yes, the chordae tendon do pull on the tricuspid valves and the mitral valves, but they're not pulling on them to open them. They're pulling on them to help keep them from opening. 
So here's how this works. The valves are opening fully when blood is coming from the upper chamber into the lower chamber, okay? And then when the lower chamber is contracting and wants to push blood out, that valve needs to be closed so that blood is not going back up into the atrium, okay? So think of a parachute with the strings and the little man. The parachute is like the valve and the strings are the chordae tendinae, and the man is the papillary muscle, okay? So we want all of this to work normally, okay? So when the valves are closed, we've got two little parachutes and all their little strings, and this muscle is contracting, so that when the ventricle is contracting, these valves are staying closed, and the blood is going out the blood vessel where it's supposed to be going out. Now, when this doesn't work right, this is what happens. That valve flips upside down because the chordae tendine are not working. You have a lot of pressure down below wanting to push those valves upside down. So the chordae tendine needs to be pulling down on them. So yes, you were right if you said the chordae tendine are gonna pull them down, but they're gonna pull them down to keep them closed, not to open them. All right, let's get back to the heart and look at the other two valves because we have two valves for exiting the ventricle and they're gonna be named for the blood vessel that the blood is going to be entering. So when we leave the right ventricle, we are going to be entering this vessel through the pulmonary valve. And the name of the blood vessel is the pulmonary trunk. Okay, so there's only one blood vessel at the other side of the pulmonary valve. And the word pulmonary is a word that means lungs, okay? So the problem is we've got a right lung and we've got a left lung, but we only have one pulmonary trunk. Okay, so we have multiple blood vessels that have the name trunk in them. They're all arteries. And what that word trunk means is it's an artery that's going to divide. So the pulmonary trunk is an artery that's going to divide into a right pulmonary artery that goes to the right lung, because this is my right lung and the left pulmonary artery that's going to go to the left lung. Okay. Why is it going to the lungs? To pick up oxygen. That's why I'm showing it in blue, because this is deoxygenated blood going to the lungs, but it's arterial blood. So remember way back when, and I said, Arteries are not all red. There's a perfect example. All right, so it's these are arteries going to the lungs to pick up oxygen. All right. On the left side of the heart, we have the aortic valve, which is taking blood from the left ventricle and dumping it into the aorta, which is the largest artery in your body. And its branches will send blood everywhere else in your body. So what you should notice is that all of these valves are at the same level in the heart, which means from the atria to the ventricles, blood is going to go down with gravity. Perfect. But from the ventricles, blood goes up. So the squeezing of the ventricles has to start from the bottom and then gets pushed upward. And then as the blood is up here in the pulmonary trunk and in the aorta. Once those ventricles relax the push, then gravity is gonna make the blood that's in the pulmonary trunk fall backwards. And notice that these valves, the little cusps, when they fill with blood, they will cause those valves to close because notice the pulmonary valve and the aortic valve 
are oriented opposite directions of the tricuspid valve and the mitral valve. All right, that's it for heart anatomy. Come on back. Well, now we're gonna put all these things we've learned about blood vessels and heart together and talk about your circulation. I'll see you shortly.